Perfect. Okay. So we are back and I don't have any messages. So it looks like everyone was able to use this link gratefully. So what I want to do is I just want to talk a little bit more about the contraindications for peels. And I want to talk about the different peels that we have in the clarity line, as well as the deincrustation gel, the glycolic, the salicylic, and the cherry peel, which is absolutely my favorite. I also want to talk about different um, skin types and conditions to where you need to approach with the chemical peel, how to set expectations for chemical peels, and what, what it means to do proper aftercare for not only yourself, but for the client. So give me just a second. I will share my screen. Perfect. Okay. So can everyone see the new screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So contraindications for chemical peels. If you did not know, or if, ha if you hadn't done the pre-peel assignment, a chemical peel is really a skin resurfacing procedure in which a chemical solution is applied to the skin to remove the top layers. The skin that comes back in after a chemical peel will be smoother and younger looking. So that's a basic summary of a chemical peel. You can use a chemical peel to treat current acne outbreaks, prevent acne, wrinkles, pigmentation and scarring, and you can apply chemical peels on the face, but you can also use them on the chest and the back. I can tell you there is very good money in chemical peels by adding in the chest and or the back. Think about it. If you've got a teen, 20, 22 years old, money to, money to burn and they've got acne scarring on their back, you can use a chemical peel combined with microderm to help lift that and smooth out the tone and texture of their back. So chemical peels are really, really good to use in your arsenal as an esthetician. They are what I like to call treatments, right? So a facial can very easily be just a relaxation service. You know, I get a facial because I want to lay back. I want to relax. I want to listen to the music. I want to feel the massage. I get a facial treatment like a chemical peel, a microderm, dermaplaning, microneedling, nanoleedling, LED. I get those things because I want to cause change. Okay, so those are the key differences between a basic and or an advanced facial. Chemical peels treat the skin, they create change. Chemical peels also come in different lengths. You have a light, a medium, or a deep. It's important that you understand that as an esthetician, I believe our max currently is 30% in depth. That we can, not depth, I'm sorry, 30% that we can use in, in terms of percentage in a chemical peel. You have a light peel, a medium peel and a deep peel. Light peels are great for stacking, so are medium peels. Deep peels are done by physician. They typically require some type of sedation or numbing. So they are literally peeling. Let me see if I can find an example. Let's see. Deep peels look like this. They are physically peeling that top layer off. This is gonna be done in the doctor's office. You're gonna see the skin peeling in flakes and chunks versus mid-death peels, which are typically gonna be light flaking at most and then light peels where you won't even see a flaking at all. So this is a deep peel. Uh, it's a TCA peel, triclocoric acid. That is a very, very deep peel. It's done by a physician. It's not something you would actually get your hands on unless you work on, in a physician's office, but you see how much it's actually peeling and look how great the results are. So how long, the, is the, how long is the peeling for? It depends on the product. That's a very good question. It could peel from anywhere from three to seven to 10 days. 
Okay. Yep. It depends on the product. So anything you do as an esthetician, if you, depending on it, it works by layers. And we'll talk about that in just a second, but it works by layers. So the more layers you pull on, the deeper the peel is going to be, the lower the pH, the deeper the peel is going to be. But for the most part, people can expect peeling within two to three days and continue to peel between the three to 11 day mark. But you as an esthetician, light and medium is your wheelhouse. So a light chemical peel is very superficial. It'll remove the outer layer of the skin and it can be used to treat fine lines, wrinkles, acne, uneven skin tone and dryness. Medium chemical peels are gonna remove skin cells from the epidermis and um, can go as deep as portions of the upper dermis, upper layer of the dermis. This will treat wrinkles, acne, scars, and even uneven skin tone. Deep peels, which are performed by a physician, are going to be um, affecting the dermis, which is live skin. They're going to be recommended by a physician and they're going to treat deeper wrinkles, scarring, uh, precancerous growths pigmentation, you name it, a deep peel is going to, going to treat that. Um, deep peels are amazing. They're only recommended once a year, once every two years at that. Whereas a light peel can be done every two to three weeks for six, a series of six treatments versus a chemical peel that can be done every three to six weeks for a six week series. So a lot of people do their peels from a business standpoint as series. So you'll hear me reference it as a series. I recommend you always selling your chemical peels if they are gonna be light in a series of six. So every one to two weeks, they come in and get a peel for six weeks. Medium, once a quarter, and then deep again under a physician once a year. Let's talk a little bit about some contraindications. So can someone read the first uh, contraindication? Uh, use of Accutane, Retin-A, or other medications that exfoliate or thin the skin within, within six months. Perfect. So the reason that is, is because Accutane, Retin-A, and other medications that, like they said, exfoliate or thin the skin, they compromise the top layer of skin. So you have less dead skin, your skin is thinner, your skin is weaker. So I might, let's say I take Accutane for two years. My skin is gonna be very different than if I hadn't taken Accutane in consistency, texture, ability to prevent inflammation, a whole bunch of things, right? So my skin is compromised. If I do a light chemical peel, it may respond like a medium chemical peel and so on and so forth. So it is important that if a client is using any medical grade exfoliation type products or taking any medical grade, uh, any products that are medical grade that they do not get a chemical peel for at least six to 12 months, depending on how long they've been taking it. Write that down, that's very important. The next one, recent cosmetic surgery, laser resurfacing, deeper medium depth chemical peels or dermabrasion. So I'm going to give you a time frame in which you can do uh, repeat services. Please write this down. Light peels. You can do light peels once a week for six weeks. And then every six weeks from there. Medium chemical peels. You can do one peel every three to four weeks for six services, so for six sets, and then once a quarter from there. Can you repeat that one again, please? For medium depth chemical peels, you can do one peel every three to four weeks for a series of six peels. So every three weeks for six Every three weeks, six times, you can do a chemical peel. And then from there, once a quarter. So once every 90 days. And that's light to medium, medium. Claire. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt you. Did you say, um, I don't know if you've talked about um, women of color being able to get that. 
that you say darker skinned women can get that? So I hadn't talked about uh, Fitzpatrick yet. Good question. Okay. Um, so chemical peels work differently on different skin types. And when we talk about each individual peel, we will talk about why and what uh, skin colors can and cannot get what. That okay. is called the Fitzpatrick scale, and it's going to be an assignment. So for y'all on the call, it'll be an extra hours assignment. For those listening to the replay, it'll be required. So we will talk about different skin tones and um, what peels you can get. Good question. Claire. Yes, ma'am. On you explaining the time frame of each, the light and then light to medium, can you, can you tell me what the light one was again? Was it one to four weeks or one to? Once every week for the first six weeks. Okay. And then once every uh, four weeks from there. Okay. You can think of a light peel, like an enzyme. Okay. Okay. So then, and the deep peels, um, I would say once a year, but that is up to physician's recommendation. You will not perform a deep peel unless you work in a medical practice. Okay, so um, go ahead and read through the list of the neck of the rest of them. And then I'm going to let y'all read that. And then when I come back, I'm going to answer any questions you may have about the other contraindications. So go ahead and read the list on the right. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about any of the other con uh, contraindications? All of them make sense? Anything not make sense? Um, I do have a question, oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead, Kim. For um, diabetes, kind of like with some, um, some like treatments you're able, like as long as it's under control, you're able to do it on someone who has diabetes. Is that the same for this one or no, you can't do it at all? With the physician's letter, and I would only do light to medium. Okay. Um, and that's simply because di exfoliating is controlled wound healing. You're wounding the skin to force it to regenerate. Someone with diabetes, their, their body does not heal itself the same or as quickly as someone without diabetes. So introducing controlled wounds where a no, a, I'm not gonna say normal, a healthy client may heal in three to seven days. Someone with diabetes may take three weeks. You don't want a client walking around into the environment with exposed skin cells for three weeks. It's just not worth the time. So with, when it comes to things like diabetes, heart, di heart disease, um, I would absolutely get a physician's note just saying the physician has said this client has been in their care and that they don't see any reason they cannot have, you know, a chemical peel. That way it just kind of covers you insurance wise if something does go wrong. So any other contraindication questions when it comes to peels? Can you explain uh, the deficient immune system? deficient immune system. So if they're not healthy, if they have, um, what's the word, lupus or any other type of uh, condition that weakens their immune system, HIV, AIDS, their body, anybody whose immune system is compromised is not a good candidate for an advanced service. Because again, chemical peels are controlled wounds. You're controlling the damage that you're doing. But when there's damage, there has to be healing. Your immune system is responsible for healing. So if there's something wrong with your immune system, you may not heal properly. 
So therefore it is not smart or in their best interest to perform that service. Gotcha, thank you. You're welcome. And then I had another question. Go ahead. Would you be doing a class for, um, oh, I think you already said, Never mind. ignore me. <laughs> no, go ahead, I don't, what, what were you gonna say? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you already said it, I was asking about um, like a class on like the Fitzgeralds, like certain treatments, but you already said oh. it. Right? Yeah, I will absolutely do a specific class on Glygol, which is um, wrinkling, and fit and um, Fitzpatrick, which is skin categorized, like color. Like I'm a Fitzpatrick four, somebody else is a Fitzpatrick one, somebody else is a Fitzpatrick five. So I will do a specific class on Fitzpatrick and Glygol scale. Those are advanced topics, so I'll uh, do it. I'll make a link for it in a day and a time, and I'll invite you all to it. That's still a good question. It's okay. And I didn't write it down. So therefore. Perfect. Okay. That's down. Any more questions before I move on to the next little tidbit? Fantastic. Okay. As you see here, it says some protection is vital to successful results. Again, controlled wound healing. You talk, we talked about the layers of the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous, right? The epidermis is dead skin. That's, that's our wheelhouse. That's what we see, touch, and manipulate. When you perform a chemical peel, you are stripping away layers of the epidermis. The deeper the peel, the more layers you strip away. The sun produces light rays, both UVA or UV aging rays, ultraviolet aging rays, or UVB, ultraviolet burning rays. Both of those things sound awful. I don't wanna be aging, I don't wanna be burning. But alas, nature has other things to say. So when you do any type of advanced facial, but specifically a chemical peel, aftercare is a priority. Okay, you cannot strip away the protective layer of dead skin and not protect the new skin and think you're going to have good results. For example, me, whenever I peel or do a series of peels, my priority function is pigmentation, right? I have hyperpigmentation. I want to get rid of it with chemical peeling. Does it do me any good to, chemical, to chemically peel my face? get all new healthy skin to come to the surface and then stand outside and burn it? No, that's dumb. You want to protect the new skin that you just brought to the surface. It's actually really important that you baby that skin because your defenses are weakened. It's easier for external factors to penetrate the skin and cause damage. So we have to have to have to take care of it. I recommend that after a chemical peel, you use a SPF of no lower than 30, but a 50 or 70 is going to be ideal. When you get it up into the 50s and the 70s, those are basically white chalk. No one likes them, but they are necessary for that first two to three weeks after a chemical peel. Um, let me also pull up, hold on one second. I'm gonna pull up some additional aftercare for chemical peels. Um, but it's really important to make sure that when you are doing peels, you're performing this type of service, that you are really good on explaining and providing the proper aftercare to a client. Oh no, where's my infographic? Hold on. Okay, I don't see my infographics. So I'm going to put it in the notes to myself to send it to you all for aftercare. Okay, it's in my notes. So I will send you an infographic that talks about aftercare. But in summary, the aftercare that's important for a chemical peel is to make sure that you're using SPF to make sure that the client is properly cleansing the skin after 
uh, chemical peel and that the client is properly nourishing the skin after a chemical peel. So someone come on and answer the question, what is the proper aftercare for a chemical peel? Um, uh, the use of SPF, no less than 30, um, but you said like 50 to 70 was ideal. Um, you really want to like baby the skin and nurture it and then properly cleansing it. Absolutely. So hydrate and nurture the skin, making sure that you're putting in good serums, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, making sure that you're using um, hyaluronic acids, you're using uh, serums that are good for pigmentation. If pigmentation is your goal, you're using ogliopeptides if acne is control is your goal whatever your goal is you want to make sure you're nourishing with those type of serums and and masks you also want to make sure you're properly cleansing the skin so that you are removing any physical dirt or debris as well as makeup and things like that there are chemicals and products in our makeup that we don't want to negatively penetrate the skin now that it's been exposed and you also want to make sure you protect it with the uh, proper SPF of at least 30%, but as high as you can get it. It's also important to make sure that the client does not manipulate the skin or get any other advanced treatments for a, a set of time. So depending on the peel that you use, you wanna wait a certain amount of time before they do any other advanced treatment. So with a light peel, that time is about seven days with a medium peel, they want to wait uh, seven to 14. And with a deep peel, they're going to want to go with their doctor's recommendation. But that's for them to use any type of deep or advanced treatment as well. So you're not going to get a chemical, a medium depth chemical peel today and a microderm in three days. You're going to want to wait the at least seven to 14. So especially if there's any visible peeling present. If there's visible peeling present, you want to make sure that they do not exfoliate the skin until all visible peeling has subsided. Does that make sense to anyone? I, don't, I don't hope I didn't skip over that too quickly. Okay, perfect. So I want to talk about a couple of products really quickly, and then I will leave you all for the day. And then I'll send out the after call assignment for the Fitzpatrick and the Glycol. But I want to talk about some products that have to do with peeling. And then I will also have a call set up. I'll send out a call to where you'll watch me actually perform a chemical peel itself. Mm, let's find Zoom. Okay. Pardon the um, layout. I can't get the newest version of this to download, so we're going to have to use the, the temporary version. Okay, so some products that I wanted to talk about when it comes to peeling. When we do the demonstration video and I actually perform a, a peel, you'll see me perform the prep the cleanse, the prep, you'll see me perform the actual acid application and you'll see me perform the new neutralizing application and if called for a masking and a protection application. But I wanna talk a little bit about these things that you use in a peel and why you use them. So the first one is a peel prep solution. A peel prep solution is a liquid solution. It's typically um, or in our case, it's a light alpha hydroxy acid solution. It removes traces of lipids and topical debris in preparation for professional strength salicylic exfoliation. And it is recommended for use prior to each treatment. So our pre prep solution is recommended for our alpha hydroxy acids. It removes trace amounts of lipid and topical debris. Does anybody know what a lipid is? If you don't know what it is, Google it and read it out loud for us. Is it a fat? 
Exactly. Lipids are fats in the skin. Oils, fats, they're, it's naturally occurring in our skin. Lipids are going to prevent the acid from working its best, so we want to remove it. Pre, uh, peel prep solution is also really good to use as a dehydrator before any advanced exfoliation. So you can use the peel prep solution before microderm if you'd like to, because it is an alpha hydroxy acid. So it's going to remove traces of uh, lipids, fatty acids, and any topical debris not removed from cleansing. So I did the, I sent out the pre-peel assignment. Can someone explain to me what an alpha hydroxy acid is? Hold on one second. Those are the ones that are plant derived, right? And then the other ones are from animals, or I mean, not animals, but they're made. Sorry, I'm muted. Hold on one second. Okay, I apologize. Okay, so go ahead. What were you saying? What are AHAs? Is it anyone or are you just- Oh yeah, anyone. I'm sorry, I interrupted somebody. So whoever was talking, feel free to pipe back in if you, are, if you don't want to. Anybody can say what an AHA is and I have it pulled up on the screen as well. It sounded like Serena, but I'll go ahead and it, it, they're like the natural occurring mild acids. Okay, so AHAs are a group of acids. They're called alpha hydroxy acid. It's not just one type of acid. It is a group of acids. So AHAs are natural and can be natural and or synthetic. And they are going to be derived from things like apples, lactic acid, um, not, I'm sorry, not lactic acid, that's lactic acid. So things like apples, fruit acids, things like that. So AHAs are gonna be your alpha hydroxy acids. And then you have um, BHAs, which we'll talk about BHL, BHAs as well. So a list of, a full list of alpha hydroxy, alpha hydroxy, Jesus, I cannot speak today acids are going to be, let me pull up a list. Literally nothing is working today. Is it the glycolic, lactic, matlic, and the tartaric? Yes. So glycolic, lactic, citric, mandelic, malic, and tartaric, I believe is how you pronounce it. These are going to be your AHA acids. So alpha hydroxy acids, these are gonna be that following list. Feel free to write them down, I'll say them again. Glycolic, lactic, citric, mandelic, malic, and tartaric, I believe is how you say it. So if you have AHAs, then you also have BHAs. 
Does anybody know what BHAs are? I've got it here on the screen. They're like the milder version of the AHAs. But not just milder, what else? So let's dig a little deeper. The fact that they exfoliate, I have Cengage open and I'm just reading the definition for it. Go ahead. So read the, read the definition directly from Cengage. Um, abbreviated BHAs exfoli exfoliating organic acids, salicylic acid, milder than AHAs. BHAs dissolve oil and beneficial for oily skin. Okay. So a B what makes a BHA is not that it's just lighter. What makes a BHA is just like what makes an AHA. It's an AHA is going to be a certain type of acid. A BHA is this different type of acid. Can someone find what the single BHA acid is? What is it called? I'm almost positive I'm showing it on the screen. Salicylic acid? Salicylic acid, absolutely. Or salicylic, sorry. Salicylic. So you have AHAs, which are going to be your glycolics, your lactics, your... Um, Malik, your Tatarik, your, uh, what's the other one here? Um, Mandelic and your citric acid. Each one of those acids are derived from different things. So we talked about contraindications, right? Things that mean you can't perform that service. So if someone is coming in and they want a chemical peel to help with acne, what chemical, which one of them would you use? An AHA or a BHA? Ms. You'd Cooper. use a BHA. A BHA. Okay. A BHA. Why? Because it told you to? It's going to be more, I guess, more, what's the word, more harsher, right? You're going to use a BHA because BHAs or salicylic acid will attack oil and oil and it's going to unclog the follicles. A BHA is going to be better for an a acne based client versus an AHA, which is going to be better for fine lines and wrinkles, leveling the skin and pigmentation. So make a, if you have a sheet of paper in front of you, make, I want you to write, I want you to write AHA and then I want you to write BHA. AHA or alpha hydroxy acids are going to be the acids for um, texture, tone, pigmentation. Like fine lines and wrinkles, things like that. Salicylic or BHAs are going to be more so for decongestion, acne, unclogging the pores, things like that. So I will use, let's say, glycolic. Actually, I know y'all have the answer because y'all some of y'all emailed it to me. So look at the answer, look at the thing that you emailed for your assignment, and someone tell me what glycolic is derived from. Sugar cane. Uh, that's a sugar cane. Yep, sugar cane. It is. Both of y'all had it right. So if someone is allergic to sugar, can they get glycolic acid? No. no. If I was allergic to sugar, by the way, you might as well just, just, I can't, I can't, I can't. But sugar cane is what glycolic acid is derived from. What about lactic acid? What is lactic acid derived from? Sweet birch, willow bark. And winter green. You sure? Milk. That's salicylic acid. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, no worries. So lactic acid is derived from milk. Very good. Now one I know there is one that's derived from sweet birch willow um willow, but I don't think it's the lactic. I have to look it up though. I don't know it off the top of my head. 
but you can tell, you know for sure it's lactic acid is derived from milk. Lactic, lactic acid, lactose intolerant. If someone is allergic to milk, would you use lactic acid? No. 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 What could you use instead of lactic acid? Glycolic. Glycolic acid. Absolutely. Same for malic, same to, for tocart, same for citric acid, same for mandelic acid. Now, when we talk about Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick is going to go more into depths in the, of these acids and mixtures of these acids. It's safe to say that most of these acids here are safe for darker skin and not just I don't mean just black people when I say darker skin. Indians have darker skins. Um, I think it's Mediterranean people have darker skin. It's their Fitzpatrick, not necessarily just the color. So keep that in mind when we go back and talk about, um, I cannot think today. When we go th back and talk about Fitzpatrick and what acids can be used on who. Just know light to mild versions of all AHAs and all BHAs can typically be used on darker skin without a problem. So then let's go. We talked a little bit about those acids in general, but I want to pull up. I want to pull up the actual acids that we provide and I want to show you how to approach an acid and determine if it's going to be what you need for your client. Well, please, thank you. Okay. I literally had this up and it locked me out. There we go. Um, just to touch base back on the pre-prep prep solution. So again, it's a light alpha hydroxy acid and it is recommended before a salicylic level exfoliation and it's recommended to use prior to each actual um, surface. The good thing about this is you can use this before glycolic or salicylic. So you can use it before AHA or BHA. That's why I went with this one. So the Pre, uh, the peel prep solution is good before any chemical application for glycolic, for AHAs or for BHAs, and it allows for maximum effectiveness of your acid by removing those tra trace lipids. Before we go into the other, the actual acids, I also want to show you the neutralizing solution. All peels are different right? And it's not because of the acid itself. So it's not because of the AHA or the BHA, but it's different because of the ingredients or the way it was made. So the reason you need a neutralizing solution is because all peels don't self-neutralize. There are companies whose chemical peels will self-neutralize, which is great. And there are some that won't. Can, does anybody want to take a stab and see and Guess what neutralize means? Stop the enzyme? Absolutely, it stops the chemical. So these are acids or chemicals, not enzymes. But yeah. I meant, I meant, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I was thinking of the product that I think. Gotcha, yeah, it's stopping the actual chemi chemical from doing its thing. So in the video that I played earlier, I talked about like Pac-Man. When I think of chemical peels and acids, once I put them on the skin, I think of the acid like Pac-Man, right? You, you apply it on and there's a bunch of little Pac-Man going through and eating off the dead skin. Well, in order to stop the Pac-Man, you have to actually neutralize with a neutralizing solution, water or no neutralizing solution, depending on the peel itself. So for all three of the clarity options, they require neutralization. Water alone will not immediately stop the action of the glycolic, the salicylic, or the cherry. This solution quickly raises the alkalinity of the skin, preventing possible redness and irritation, which will result from prolonged exposure to the skin. So if you don't neutralize a peel, you won't eventually eat away all the skin right? But you will 
really, really scar the skin, which will, which can result in chemical burns, um, redness, irritation, destroying of the cells. So it is really important that you properly neutralize any peel that you put on. This is just the ingredients, so on and so forth. So the acids themselves have what's called a pH. So the peel prep solution, the pH at any given time is between 3.5 and 4.0. I don't believe we talked about pH of the skin. Actually, I'm sure we have. Who knows the pH of the skin? What's the range? 5.5. 5.5 to I believe six something possibly. Um, so the average pH of the skin is gonna be 5.5. So when you have a pH scale in front of you, let me just pull it up. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. Really quickly on pH. So pH is potential hydrogen. The pH scale starts from zero and goes all the way up to 14. You have acidic from zero to six-ish. You have neutral from six to 10-ish. And you have from 10-ish to 14, which is alkaline. So you have acidic, neutral, and alkaline. Where does the skin naturally fall? Acidic between acidic and neutral. It's closer to neutral than it is acidic. So on an average day, our skin is, if properly hydrated and well taken care of, between neutral and mildly acidic. Our skin is never overly alkaline. Our skin is never overly acidic. The key to a chemical peel is not the acid itself, but it's the proper acid with the proper amount of passes and the proper pH. So our peel prep solution preps the skin, right? It's removing that top layer of lipids and topical debris. So the pH is lower. You're looking at 3.5 to 4.0. 3.5 to 4.0. So you're dropping yourself down about one to two points, right? From your natural skin here to here. You'll feel mild tingling, mild stinging. It shouldn't itch, it shouldn't burn. If someone overreacts when you put on the peel prep solution, do you think they're a good candidate for a chemical peel? No. No. Absolutely not. Their skin is too sensitive. A peel is not recommended for them. The pre prep solution is really beneficial because it lowers the pH incrementally as opposed to going from 5.5 to 2. The neutralizing solution does the exact opposite. It brings it back up, effectively stopping the acid from working. Does everyone understand that so far? Yes. Yes. Very interesting. Yes, it, yes. Is, it is actually very interesting because what you did, what I did not know for the longest time is all this is, is baking soda. Does everyone see this ingredient right here? Mm -hmm. yes. What did you, you say it was? Baking soda. You can oh, wow. neutralize a chemical peel with baking soda. The only reason I chose not to go that route is one, because the people using it are learning, but two, because you have to mix baking soda one to one. And if your numbers are off, it's not as effective versus having a ready-made neutralizing solution that I know is going to be effective as soon as I put it on. So that is- I only knew that because I garden. <laughs> you garden? Yes, I do. How do we you have a garden in our backyard. Well, because when at the pH levels, I have to, I have to monitor the pH of the soil. Ah, so if the pH is too low, you add baking soda. Mm -hmm. Or if it's ah. too high, then I have to get something to raise it. That is so I mean, interesting. Yeah. I never would have known that. I don't like outside, so there's <laughs> I like flowers. I was, I was going to ask, though, if like, they're going to test us on the pH, like, I guess, the scale. 
they're going to ask you what the pH, what pH means, but I don't think they're going to go into very, I don't recall them going into very detail. But when you're working with Vivian and Callie on P PSI, you'll eventually start going chapter by chapter that's actually on the test. And if pH is in one of the chapters, then I would recommend studying it, but I don't believe it is. I think what, you know what, I'm, I'm, they're gonna, if they ask you anything about pH, they're gonna ask you what pH means, potential hydrogen, or they're gonna ask you what's the pH of the skin. Okay. Um, and what's, what's alkaline, what's, uh, what's acidic. Got it. Perfect. Okay, so we'll wrap up and talk about the individual peels that we have themselves. There are protocols to each one of these peels. Salicylic is going to be more of an acid, excuse me, glycolic. The glycolic that we have is going to be used more for pigmentation, fine lines and wrinkles, anti-aging. And then our cherry peel, which is one of my favorite, is great for hyperpigmented skin, environmentally stressed, oily, and combination and mature. So you can think of the glycolic as the first set of peel, the first peel that you would do for a client and that's looking to brighten and then a series of cherry brightening peels and then back to glycolic. So starting with the cherry brightening, the professional cherry peel is a powerful rejuvenation treatment that promotes collagen while uh, remediating lack of uh, uniformity. So it's great for skin tone on the face, neck, and decollete. This um, peel encourages cellular respiration while removing devitalized skin cells. So this is a powerhouse peel. It's that next level from a basic AHA or BHA. It uses a cherry type of uh, acid that's going to really promote cellular turnover. So it's really good for your aging clients, but it also is really good for pigmentation and overall environmentally stressed skin. This is a mid-depth peel. You're gonna wanna use it once and then wait at least two weeks before doing anything else. And after the two weeks, you're, after the treatment, you're gonna wanna wait at least, I would say 90 days before you perform another cherry peel again. The pH of this product is 3.5. And it does require a patch test before you use it on, to, on the entire face. You're just going to do that patch chest right below the ear and leave on for up to five minutes, rinsing it thoroughly. But the professional cherry peel is really, really good for rejuvenation. This is the peel that's going to really make your skin glow, but it's not the peel that you want to use for someone's first peel experience. With this, depending on how many layers you do, you may actually experience peeling or flaking of the skin. And you can use this peel for up to five to between five and 10 minutes. Then you have the lactic. The lactic peel we already talked about, it's a serum type of peel. So it's not very liquidy, it's a little thicker, but it's going to be good for fine lines, lack of hydration and uniformity and anyone too sensitive for a glycolic treatment. You also wanna use this for someone who is currently experiencing a lot of congestion or clogging in the skin. So the lactic peel is gonna be good for someone mature, dry, flaking, a little bit of pigmentation, a little bit of oily, but if you don't have salicylic available, the lactic is gonna be your next best thing for treating acne. This is a 30% lactic um, serum. So I would do no more than three layers of this serum. And you can get mild flaking from this as well. This is also a pH of 3.5. So it is much lower than the, the actual skin. And you, like I said, you will experience some flaking depending on how many layers that you do, but I don't recommend more than three. And lastly, the glycolic, overall going to be good for dry, mature, environmentally uh, distressed, hyperpigmented, and that oily skin. This is not at all recommended for sensitive skin. So if you have a client who has sensitive skin and they want to deal with um, dry or mature skin, you could use the 
lactic over the glycolic. If they're not sensitive, you can use the glycolic over the lactic. This is also a 30% uh, glycolic solution. So it's a pretty mid-depth peel and you want to do up to three passes with this as well. So if you see here, it says allow solution to remain on the skin for two to three minutes in total. This is pure acid. So of course it's mixed with other things, but it's not, it's not um, like the cherry peel that you can leave on for much longer. This is gonna give you more acid right away. So you wanna use this by itself no longer than two to three minutes in total, meaning each pass to be about 30 to 60 seconds, two to three passes at a time, depending on the client's skin. The good thing about the lactic and the glycolic is you can definitely follow it up with a nice uh, mask to hydrate or replenish the skin afterward. You're likely to only see actual peeling or flaking if you do that third pass, and it's good for skin texture as well. This pH is also a 3.5. I wanted to talk a little bit about cost for peels because peels should be one of your more expensive services. You can charge anywhere from 125 to 225 a peel. And you can, like I said, charge them in a series. And if you get a chemical peel, you have to buy aftercare. So this is a very high dollar type of treatment, so it's definitely recommended to do it. The thing with chemical peels is that they have to be done during the fall at the earliest and the winter. You don't want to do peels really in spring and summer. Spring is okay, but not too deep into spring, and summer uh, is a no-no completely. So that's because the sun is you know it's the hottest it's the sun's at its peak you don't want to there's less cloud coverage in the summer you don't want to expose the client to a lot of sun after a peel so the peel season is traditionally fall and winter so that the client can get the best benefits without having a risk of a lot of exposure and chemical peels does that make sense to everyone Fantastic. Yes. Yes. And I wanted to say just price point wise, if you think about a chemical peel, it's also one of your cheaper services. So it costs you the least to do and it costs the customer the most. So for example, an eight ounce bottle of the professional glycolic is $110. But with that eight ounce bottle, you can do 96 two layer peels from that bottle. So you're looking at a cost per service of anywhere between 84 cents or lower, depending on how many uh, layers you do per peel. So you can really get a lot of bang for your buck because all you really need to do in a peel is cleanse, prep, peel, neutralize, moisturize, and protect, send them out the door. When it comes to peeling mask and the other things, extractions, all that is not necessary. Those are bonuses. So you make the most money from chemical peels because you can do it. I can do a 30 minute glycolic peel application. 30 minutes meaning five minutes in the beginning to consult, consult five minutes in the end to make sure everything's okay and check you out. 20 minutes hands on and charge you 225 for a peel because of the results that you get with acids. Acids are our big money maker, right? So you, when I, I talked a little bit about upgrade, not upgrading, but stacking. So if you have a basic facial that's $65 that comes with the daily exfoliator or the exfoliating enzyme powder, and that's $65. If a client, if you're doing the consultation and the client has really rough textured dry skin, and you've worked with them before and you're like, I've really been trying to exfoliate the skin for you and get it to be a lot more even texture wise and tone wise. I think we should upgrade you to a single pass glycolic advanced facial and you do the enzyme powder and then you follow up with the exfoliant. You can charge them an extra 45 to $65 for that and you don't even add on more time because you do one pass for 60 seconds. 
And if they want an actual chemical peel, that's the one, you know, that's the 150 and you do up to three passes of the glycolic. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. So chemical peels are really effective. They're your treatment products. Same with microderms, same with dermaplaning, same with microneedling. All those things are so that you can produce a result. So with that, I'll double check the roll again, but does anybody have any questions while I am checking the roll? Yes, Claire, um, okay. will we be able to purchase the pills from you, the bottle? Yes, you will be able to purchase the bottle. Um, so what I'm doing is putting together a online training class specifically for the peels so that in order for you to purchase it, you have to show completion of that, take a test, and then you can purchase it. Because once you get into peels, you know, you need to be at a certain level. But yes, you will be able to purchase them. You'll just have to take like a verification course that should okay. take you no more than about four hours. That's awesome. And you don't have to you don't have to take you don't have to take that to buy the peel prep and the neutralizing solution because you can use the peel prep before any exfoliant and the neutralizing solution after the deincrustation or after like extractions. So yeah. only for the actual acids will you have to do that. Okay. And I love chemical chemical peels are so awesome. Like I can't wait oh to God. actually get one. I just haven't done it because it's it's summer and I'm about to be out of town. So I'm like, nope, I'm gonna wait. So when I get back, I'm gonna actually do it on myself so y'all can see the different application techniques and stuff. But you wanna be in the house after a chemical peel and I'm about to be out living the best life. Okay. I have a question. Go Are you, you're gonna be adding those to the protocol books? They are already in the protocol books and I, um, like they're, they're in the protocol books, they're on the site, you can order them. The, I just don't have the physical copy because the graphic team, I can't, they need to resend it to me. But they, it has been updated and they're in there with those protocols. So as soon as I get it, I, would, I was planning on uploading it to the drive and sending it all to y'all so y'all can have the chemical peel protocols and stuff. Okay. I was like, I didn't see it in there, but perfect. It, it will, it's coming. That's why I had to show the, the, the ratchet version. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> but it is coming. As soon as they send it to me, I've already asked for it. Any more questions? Um, yes. Do okay. you know or have any clue when we'll be able to go back to uh, class or the building? <laughs> I do not know. Um, what I want to do is send out a, like a, a survey thing so we can vote uh -huh. the August 17th. So nothing, we won't go back before August 17th. I can say that 100%. We will not go back before August 17th. But over the next week or so, I will be sending out a survey to get a read to see how many people actually are ready to go back or you know willing to go back and see how I can stagger it or what I can do so that at least starting in August, you know, every other week, or every week there's like time frames that people can come into the building and there's only so many people. It's just, we can't oh, okay. do it like we did last time. So I wanna send out something to see. Cause if, if five people wanna go back and the other 50 are like, no, I'm fine with the online, we'll continue the online. But I wanna put it out there to make it, you know, to make it fair and kind of get a vote and see where everyone is at and not just assume. Okay. Okay, so let me get that out to you. Um, I will be doing that. So, so Claire, you know, with, with you saying it that way, um, you know, you would have like times where people will come back in, but you know, with, with us doing like going back into the office, I would only have a certain time I would be able to come in. So, right. I mean, I wouldn't, the staggering wouldn't work for me at all. Right. And that's, that's, that's one of the problems that I'm running into because how do I say, is it yeah. first come first serve between 10 and 12, 10 people can come the first 10 people to sign up, get that slot and right. still allow online times. Because the problem is if I say, well, the building is open, but you can still do online. You're going to come one week or one day. And then the next day you're be like, I don't really feel like coming. I'm going to do online. You know what I mean? Like it, I have to figure out a way that makes it 
fair for everyone, but actually work logistic wise, because we are very small staff. We can't afford to have somebody in the building just hoping two people show up and, and then they don't. So yeah, we're, we're I was, I was gonna, I was gonna recommend, like, I wonder if you guys 